script the screens want to welcome you to the craft of the writer director with the very prolific and wildly talented Mr. Stephen Conrad. And Stephen's bio biography is much too expansive to discuss in detail, but I'd like to highlight a few key points. Mr. Conrad is an American screenwriter, producer, and director. The first screenplay he sold is called Wrestling Ernest Hemingway, adapted from a short story he had written for creating a writing class. Um, he followed up with The Weatherman, which he also produced, and The Pursuit of Happiness. In 2013, he adapted a James Thurber short story for the film The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, directed by and starring Ben Stiller. In 2015, he developed Patriot for Amazon Studios and it premiered in its entirety in February 2017. In addition to executive producing the series, he has also written, directed, written and directed most of the first season's episodes. In the same year, Stephen rewrote the script for Wonder and wrote, produced, and directed two seasons of Patriot and premiered the first season of Perpetual Grace Lititude on Epics. And now one of the most profound credits to add to this impressive list is he is a script to screens judge. And we are all very lucky and feel blessed to have him on board and very excited. So uh, diving in here, I told Steven when we met that there are two writers in the entire world that I call genius. One of them is Charlie Kaufman and the second is Steven Conrad. So I'm very, very much just blessed to welcome you guys and um, introduce you to the talented Mr. Stephen Conrad. Stephen, thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. I haven't had <laughs> many occasions to, to talk to the people who, who like the show, so I'm excited to spend some time with... Uh, yeah, we are so excited to be with We have a lot of questions that came in, and there are a lot of huge fans of the shows and of, of all of your work. Um, and on that note, one of the topics I wanted to talk about is inspiration and diving into what inspires you and what inspires story and which stories you choose to tell. So I actually have a question from a big fan of yours named Gideon Aroni. And Gideon asks, as an aspiring writer, watching your shows slowly weave themselves like tapestries in is nothing short of breathtaking. How do you break a story like Patriot? Is it an idea, a theme, a character, or do you work backwards from the ending? Well, we always, we start with themes and uh, themes are elemental. And when I have occasion to spend time with my colleagues who are filmmakers or showrunners, I find that that's a little rare. I was surprised to hear that. that themes are really where it's at for us. And with Patriot, we uh, decided we should write about the feat of endurance that life asks of you, the event of your life that never ends, to try to finish an important task without being recognized or helped. That became the, the, the theme. And then we invented the show around that desire to write about what I think is the walk of most people's lives, which is to try to perform a very hard task while you're being unrecognized for it. And then to fend off all of the, the obstacles that surprise you the, the accomplishment is surviving, I think, for all of us. I, I wanted to, to wrap a show around that idea, and then so we built that world and picked that genre to do it with. The first thing we do at Elephant is we just start to watch the genre, so we'll just watch spy shows and spy movies, and everybody's pals here. So what inevitably, inevitably happens is we start to make fun of it a little bit, and then it becomes like mystery science theater, and I think that that's very important. The familiar um, events, storylines, details, activities, behaviors of the characters, when they're, when they're familiar enough that really clever young people start to mock them, I, I think there's a lesson in there that I think that means it's ringing false. And when it's ringing false, we try to figure out a way to, uh, to change those elements to make sure that they don't make an audience feel like that. that Rather than ringing false, we try to make it ring true. Whatever that means, I think it just means that you appreciate where the filmmakers are coming from in regard to what they have to say about life on Earth. So after the theme, what's, what's the next step that you tackle then? So let, and, and let's just take Patriot as a specific example. So you guys, what was the theme of that for you? And then how do you unravel it from there? Well, that, that, that uh, isolated endurance, enduring something alone, and, and, then, and then realizing that that is unsustainable, that you must, you, you must find 
allies. You must find assistance. You have to find help. You have to call out for it. It'll come from a place you don't expect. And when it does, you have to take it. Uh, so there's a theme. And then we just attack the genre and say, how can this be, how can we contribute to this? I, I am not interested in making a James Bond movie. I like them. Uh, I don't, that isn't a mark I'd like to make. I don't want to be responsible for those movies. I dig them. Uh, I want to be responsible for a sort of different sound, but I like them enough to respect them. So we respect the way those genres work. And then we think, well, how can we, how can we be personal? How can this come from Chicago and not Hollywood? So, so we're, we are in Chicago and we leave for work, but we create everything here. Uh, all of our shows are created in the neighborhoods in Chicago. And uh, it's helped me to try to, to stay uh, more basic, I think, than where other people might wander off. And, and by basic, I don't mean simple minded. I just mean <clears throat> that you're writing about imperative ideas, that you're writing about necessities. You're not writing about wishes, you're writing about needs. So we, that's where we start. And then we try to find those in the genre, and if they're not there, we put them in there. So you mentioned starting with a blank page. Once you move beyond theme, how much outlining do you do before you start writing the script itself? I don't do any. And I'm not sure that that's good. But I can tell you that I have been inhibited by it. It keeps me from writing. I have something I want to write about. And then I sit down and I just wait for it to say what it wants to do. And it's, it's really challenging because I have weeks where I can't write, where I don't have a process. I just wait for an idea to drop from somewhere. I know, I know the value of outlining. It, it limits you from an infinity of wrong directions. You, you want to know that the thing, you're on a path to the right place. Um, but I replace outlining with just sitting and banging my head on the desk. It's, I outline in my head, I guess. Do you start with page one though? Like, you, like if, you're, if you're tackling a feature or a pilot, do you say, I want, I have an idea for the opening scene, do you always yeah, go page I, one? I start, I start with something that I think is page one. And then when, it, when I have 20 pages, I realize it was page 20 and I need to write some stuff before it. So I start at what I think is the beginning, but I allow myself the uh, chance to call it something else later if there's a better idea for how to do it. When I was really young, my ratio of pages that I wrote to pages that I kept was probably like 20 to one, something like that. Like 19 pages in the garbage, one page that lasted. And then maybe now it's down to 15 to, to one. I, I do the exercise of writing to find an outline and then things go, but I create, folders where that all that old material gets to live and then I, I go back when I'm stumped I go look through it just to see what I was thinking and do I is there still something alive in there so I save everything I write it doesn't really go in the garbage it just doesn't go in the, in the script and then later that gives me something but uh, the anything you're doing this is just my way but anything you're doing that isn't actually writing I don't think is as good as actually writing. Outlining, uh, the breaking the season with the writers, independent of writing, just always writing and doing those other things. And invariably, it's the thing I was just following while I was writing that will give me something that is structurally sound enough to build something up. So Stephen, on that note, how do you feel about log lines? It's necessary. I mean, that's all I can say about it is there's no getting around that part of this business. Right. It helps to be, to be functional at that. I don't think you want to be better at that than actually writing your thing, but I, 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 you got to respect that part of it because you have to contend with it. It's going to be in your life. How do you balance genre conventions while adding your own personal spin on it? Well, I happen to have a very high regard for craft. And by craft, I mean the, the unraveling of a plot. I have made movies that don't have much plot. When I was younger, I avoided it. I, I thought it was a deficiency. Um, the more practiced I became, I, I had a greater respect for the hard work it takes to do that very well. And by that, I mean just to tell 
it's the, <clears throat> at Elephant, we call it the campfire story, which is to engage an audience in a way that that thing operates. And there, there are so many different forms of storytelling that we explore here, the, the folk song, the campfire story, the joke, uh, the poem, the novel, the film. And we say, well, what, when you're telling a story, what's going, what's happening, what's going on? Uh, making an audience wonder what happens next is, is not a deficiency. I think it's a really strong uh, evocation of an a, engagement with the audience. So we work really very, very hard to, to bring craft to the thing, which means a considered and well-executed, in my estimation, a well-executed plot. And that the events unravel in a way that feels an inevitable, but is not expected. So th that's a principle here, that it feels right, but it can't exactly have been anticipated. And when we do our genre breakdowns and we watch the different iterations of these shows, th some of the kids in the office get very good at calling out what's about to happen. And I happen to have had a dad who was exquisite at that, it ruined every movie we watched together, but he, he was a page ahead of the audience, always a page ahead of the audience. Um, he guessed the end of uh, Bruce Willis and the ghost kid, or Bruce Willis is a ghost and the kid doesn't know it, and then he's a oh, ghost. Six days. Yeah, my dad, yeah. first thing my dad is he's a ghost and <laughs> he always do it. So that helped me to try to find a way to keep a guy like that engaged. And um, anyway, that's, that's how we put, put one and two together. And then I had a, I have a, one of my pals, Gore Babinski, who made The Weatherman, uh, he's essentially taught me a lot of the craft of directing. And he said, we, we say two plus two and you let the audience say four. We don't say two plus two equals four. And that was a cool little reduction of a simple but uh, wise principle. So, so with plot, we, we, allowed, we allow the audience to, to put it together. Um, it's risky to... to I have friends who have a different take on what the show's saying and doing than I intended. Um, I used to be down on watching closed captions, but now I'm into it because it helps the audience follow it a, a little better. But anyway, so a, a plot that allows the audience to put, put it together and just say this, I know what's going on. If you follow closely, it's more deeply satisfying because uh, it's, um, if we do our job right, you don't see it coming. So tell me a little bit about putting together the writer's room for The Patriot, and then are you very much involved in picking the writers, and do you have a say on the writers? Yeah, they're, they're all, with the exception of Bruce Terrace, they're all people who started out at Elephant as my assistants. And oh, wow. They're, but they're writer's assistants. They don't get my dry cleaning. They're doing research and, and breaking down scenes from films. So. Um, and they've all, they, they just get the way we do it at Elephant and they've graduated to being real contributory voices in, in the shows. And so the rooms, it's five people. It's Bruce Terra, Sean Hurley, uh, Peter Moxley, Stephen Hoy and me. And um, it's been that way for five years. And we break story together. We talk events together. And then generally in the case of Patriot, I'll write the episodes myself. In the case of Perpetual Grace, Bruce and I write them together. So the room is, it's unusual. It, we mostly hang out together and make fun of other movies and dream big and encourage each other to try to be wild, to try to make it work, to try to make it sound right. And trying to make each other laugh is a real accomplishment. There are really good vibes in that room. And I've been in rooms that are constituted by strangers and it doesn't work for, for us. So moving on, I wanted to talk about the difference between writing and directing. I think we talked quite a bit about your process for writing. So how do you tackle, I would love to hear a little bit more about your process for directing, whether it's pre-production, production and post, and then also versus my, my uh, part B to that question, I wanted to find out how do you deal with difficult actors? And if you've got some examples of how you navigated that and then different personalities. Well, I've already, I've, I've spoken, uh, a little bit already about how they're integrated writing and directing for me now and uh, mm -hmm. I, it, it probably won't happen anymore that I'm writing without directing. Um, I think I'll just always do it now but um, <clears throat> yeah. I, I regard them as the same, the same job. I mean your tools when you're 
writing their words when you're shooting their people and images and sounds and it's I don't think it's a different job I, I have to aggregate a bunch of different elements into one purpose uh, which is the opposite of writing you I mean well you do that with ideas but to do that with people is a whole nother thing but um, generally I try to write in a way that allows for there to be one apprehension like you take one very strong thing from a scene and you'll know that that's the purpose of the scene and so we gather around that idea that I'm, I'm clear about that and then the actors uh, they get it and then we get it difficult actors they that could mean any one of a dozen different things and has in, in, in my career uh, what what I guess I've gathered uh, at this point is that different people need different things to be brave. Like they ultimately, I had a, Sidney Pollack said to me when I was just starting out, I, I had made a joke that I was bagging on actors without having the sense to remember that he was a, he's a great actor. And he bristled at it and he said, just remember it's your name and it's their face. And I thought, well, they're, they're, they're putting their necks out there and I'm not really, uh, to have respect for the bravery of that feat and then to understand that their art form is magic, you know, not really magic, but I can't do it and I need them and they need me and so we figure it out. But the, the uh, 12 different people will have 12 different ways to arrive at what they need from their, their colleagues to feel brave. So I, I don't know, I haven't had anybody who, who prevented me from helping them, which is what I'm here to do. I, I promise every actor who comes to work for us that they'll have a good day's work. And then I try really hard to live up to that. And what I mean is that they'll have a scene that they can roll up their sleeves and demonstrate the skills that they've gained over a long, uh, a long career of dedicating themselves to an important art. I will, I'll give them a good day's work. And as long as I've been able to do that, it's, it's been okay. When you're a writer on a film, you don't, you don't have that connection to the organism. You can't make anybody more brave. You can't make anybody more calm. You can't make them uh, uh, more peaceful about what they're up to. Um, you're, you're limited. And I think crucially limited from really making the difference it takes to making sure your voice gets understood and heard by the 110 people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very difficult uh, compartmentalized relationship, the writer to the, to the movie. Like it, it didn't work for me. I see, interesting. You feel more at home directing then or you just always wanna write and direct together? Yeah, well, I mentioned before, it's the same job, and it really yeah. is to me. But the, the script for us is just a blueprint for how to plan a day. I give the actors their uh, homework, and then we get together, and then, then it, the script just goes away. We shoot what I wrote, but I'm under no illusion that that is going to be anything like it. Like, I have to command it in person among persons. Speaking of music, it seems to parallel your storytelling. How do you find it to inspire and inform your process? So yeah, that's a great question. If you create music ahead of time and that inspires the process or do you always create it after in post? We do both. In the, in the two TV series, we, we, do, we do either. In Patriot, uh, we, if, if you see John singing in the show, we had to figure it out first, obviously. But if you hear the song and it's, it's just living on top of the show and John's not singing it, then generally we wrote it afterwards. Perpetual Grace, we write all the original songs while I'm writing the show. So I know what is up in the air in terms of the tension and the conflict and the emotionality of the scenes. Mm -hmm. So it, that all unfolds. We, there's a there's a point in the day where we stop making film and we start making music and it's generally about nine o'clock where the the day just turns into music and um at that point i've already had 12 hours of living inside of the the film world and it's easy for me to roll into the music world and convey to to the guys i play music with that 
this is what I think we can do today. And then it changes a little bit because there's other guys in there. But um, I feel the, the need for the ad, because music is an ad, I feel the need for the ad while I'm standing there. And then at night, we, we try to create something that can be that ad. I know we've talked about it before, but I'd love to hear from, to give to everyone else an idea of what you feel the pros and cons are between features and television. Well, the, the TV has a, a, like a built-in ambition, the, 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 just the amount of hours that you've got to engage in the audience over. In the case of Patriot, it's um, 18, and Perpetual Grace so far, it's 10. It's a lot. I mean, even Perpetual Grace season one is five times the amount of time that you uh, communicate to an audience over in a feature film. So, uh, and then having some sense of where you're at in a moment, like this, you, we knew we couldn't make TV in the sense of the TV I grew up with. Like those days are over, like TV is film. And people, when they watch two or three in a row, it takes on a different demand. Like you have to, you have to make it worth that while. I think you've got to give the audience back that heavy investment of time in, in, uh, in value. And, and that has everything to do with that storytelling, that it can't repeat itself, um, that it must grow somehow, but also feel like it was the logical place for that thing to take your emotionality. It ought to, every move you make ought to feel right, but it can't be the one the audience expected you to, to do. Uh, to let them know they're in sure hands, to let them know that you can keep, if because you care about this art form, you can keep it humming. Um, the demand on that, it's not part of the way you think about features. Like they have a, they have a single objective, they're shot out of a rocket, they go up and they come down. TV shows just go. And you don't know how long you'll, they'll win you over because you don't know how good they are at doing that long middle. And I love that world now. Like it's, it's, a, it's a thing of, you know, this group of filmmakers that have come together over it on, on Patriot and Perpetual Grace, that we, we like the moment in time. We like, the, we like this idea that we're in a slightly new art form. So I, I prefer to work in television now to features. I think the ambition's greater. It's easier to find good material. Um, <clears throat> there is not an actor you can't cast today in television. Uh, the feature world's narrowed in terms of what it is uh, willing to say and do. I think until someone breaks it, someone will break, someone will make Easy Rider, you know, or do the right thing and then we'll get shaken up again. <clears throat> it's around the corner. So when you're working on a feature and you want to break that story, what is your process like? Well, that's something I do by myself, but in, in, in uh, a collaboration with a director, if there's a director on it, I, I, I figure that out. And then that's got its own engineering, uh, you know, it's got its own set, set of rules for engagement with an audience that the, you, you have to know where you're headed in, while you're in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have to know what films have gone before you and done what you yeah, essentially traffic in the world that you're in and try not to repeat them and they try to contribute to, to them. That art form is pretty young, but there's enough models now still 120 years in or so that you very seldom will try to capture an idea, a thought, a sensibility that someone hasn't, hasn't taken a shot at before. Uh, so we do a tremendous amount of film study. And then when we get into the nuts and bolts of it, we, I have long since thrown out any separation between writing and prepping and shooting and editing because we're five years into making these hours of TV. That I do that. Uh, just night and day with our cinematographer, Jimmy Whitaker, who's also a, a director for us, where we just talk films, films that work, films that don't work. Why? What's, it, what, what's the point of making Breaking Bad if you're just making a less good Breaking Bad? You can dig it and then try to figure out how to make a show that seemed like the guy who made it had seen that and liked it but wasn't copying it exactly. So we do that with films. And when I write a film, I do that. I study anything that connects in any tangential way to what I'm saying and doing. And I try to figure out how to, like for uh, Pursuit of Happiness, it was The Bicycle Thief, uh, which was about uh, 
economic uh, hunger and um, elemental on a daily basis human need to survive. So I use that m movie as a really pristine example of what someone can do if they, if they cared to do this well and try to figure out a way to cross my fingers and hope that someday you can make something that's counted in that, in that crowd. I've got a really fabulous question. Uh, all these questions are great, but a really fabulous question came in that I think if you can walk us through this process, it'll be really helpful for aspiring writers. I talk about this a lot with aspiring writers that have these questions, which is the pitching process, right? So we are all creating content and going out there and how do we get in? So basically, if you, if you want to take Patriot or Perpetual Grace, whichever one, talk a little bit about how did you pitch it? Did you go to the studios? Did you have to create a script, a, a full script, a Bible, a pilot? Did you do a lookbook? Did you do a deck? Did you do a teaser? You know, all yeah. these, these hoops that we have to jump through. We pitched Patriot to FX and the, it was uh, Gil Bellows um, and I, went into FX and Gil's one of, of the ensemble of, of Patriot and is a good friend and we pitched it to FX and they asked for a pilot script so I wrote the pilot script and they passed on the series but we had the script so the script wound up on Amazon <clears throat> pardon me and so Amazon at that moment in time which was a fleeting moment in time was up for making ambitious television and uh, had characterized themselves as the filmmaker's television studio. <laughs> <laughs> so that lasted about four months, but we got in there in that window. And uh, the executives there were up for making something like Patriot, which had uh, a genre, but also had the ambition to be fun and a little wilder. So, so there was a script, the songs were written, uh, they had a sense of the tone, which is which is pretty important to convey. And with uh, Perpetual Grace, same thing. Bruce and I pitched it to FX. They asked for the pilot. We wrote it for FX and they didn't want to make it. So we wound up at <laughs> So I guess the key is to take a meeting in FX, have them pay you to write a pilot and then pass on the series and then you can go out and do it. Oh, you mean they paid pitch. you twice to write the pilot for Patriot and Perpetual Grace? No, well, yeah, but they were, you know, like, they paid me for each of those two things once. That's, but but that's nice. Both, both of those shows started at FX and didn't, and didn't make it on to FX. Oh, wow. And then you were And my new to... show, my stop motion show. Yeah. Almost the same thing. Anyway, it, I, there, I, there's a takeaway. And the takeaway is, eh, man, it, it takes so long to get something going. Like, there's, I, I don't know a friend yeah. who made something worthwhile that it, it just went off like you you gotta hang in there and but having a finished product it was really helpful but uh when you do the initial pitch to fx did you yeah. have just a verbal pitch or did you bring any other visual materials because i know we're working on some stuff right now and you know the execs we're working with over at atlas even are saying 50 percent of them like visual pitches in the room like a deck or something and 50 percent don't what's your thought on that i've done both I think you'll feel it. If, if you have a good deck, if you find good stuff, if you feel like um, it really does illuminate your ideas, then sure, it, it's a shorthand. And, and I've found it to be very helpful yeah. to, to talk about or, or just to mention movies that you think were, were well done, you know, so that the studio knows, well, that's their idea of a good movie. Rocky's a good story. It's a mainstream movie. I'm not afraid to talk about it like it's successful. The first one, mm. very good. Like I, I can talk to a studio in, in terms of Rocky without a problem. I can't talk to them about, you know, Mission Impossible 4, I think doesn't have much to do with what we do. But those little, um, little communications from what you love, if you find a way to get into the space with, with those people you have to collaborate with inside of what they love, then it really just helps create stability in terms of what they expect. It's very, very helpful. And you know, you gotta be careful that you're not making promises you can't keep and you'll have a budget someday. And um, 
but you know, you make it, we're making films, anything you can do to help them see it. Um, just back to the process with Amazon. So when they picked up the Patriot, was there a long development process and were they hands on in that or they literally just let you and your writers break? The uh, we, were, we were in a weird, we were in a weird moment over there where they were telecasting pilots. Do you mm. remember that? They yeah. <laughs> lasted about 18 months. They'd make the pilot, they'd put it on Amazon and they would take metrics. They would read what the Amazon audience and they didn't just read what the audience thought about the oh, show. Oh, I do remember that. They did studies of like, it didn't, it didn't matter if people liked it. It mattered that people who liked it spent money on Amazon.com. It was weird. So yeah. we had to do that. So we, we went up on Amazon and somehow we threaded that needle. And then we were able to make the, the whole first season. But it was, it, was a, it was the shooting of the pilot, which I didn't have a lot of um, uh, interactions with the studio over because it was finished. But they, they, they were material to the creation of, of the show. And, and we, had, we had good executives in the early going on, on that show. And we got support. Um, by the time we started to shoot season two, we were on our third president. And you can't survive that. It's, too many people were removed from the people who were responsible really for the show. And it was just, you're gonna go down. So we knew we were going down no matter how good that second season was. Do you feel like within yourself, the Patriot is not done yet and you'd like to do another season somewhere? Or are you feel like the story is, is laid to rest? It's not the story. It, it, we, could, we could keep going, but I don't know. I mean, Patriot is really just a group of people. It's not me. It's that cast. It's our film crew. Um, everybody would have to come back that same way. And we're all still working together. It, it, I, think, I think Patriot, in, in terms of it being a television series, is not going to come back. But there are aspects of Patriot that I, I'm very eager to follow up on. For instance, I have written the there's a, I don't expect anybody to call this to mind, but there's a, there's a plot elemental in season one. There's a technical uh, book called The Structural Dynamics of Flow. Well, I just wrote it because I missed, I just missed speaking through Patriot. I, needed to, I wanted to keep doing it, so I did it with a book. Uh, Mike and I are talking about making some music together. There'll be little th things, but I, I think the way it's going to sustain is that the the group that, that makes Patriot is going to keep making things. And so Mike and I will have a new show and my brother will be in it and Jimmy Witter will shoot it and it'll feel a lot like Patriot. Um, maybe they'll give us a little more money and we can, everybody can be healthy while we make it. The, the, the terms under which we made Patriot were tremendously trying. Like we, everybody got sick on Patriot because we had to shoot so many hours. Part of why we're not still making Patriot is that that was unacceptable to me. Those terms were, we couldn't shoot what I wanted to shoot and just keep everybody safe. So I, I think that's one of the reasons we don't make Patriot anymore, but it's, that's one of the reasons we're gonna make a new show for somebody else someday where we'll have that checked off and we won't have to worry about that and we can go and do our, do our jobs. What are a couple of lessons that you learned on Patriot that you brought over and made changes, you know, on this note for Perpetual Grace? Well, we, we fell in love with the way that music can be incorporated into the storytelling and I just decided we were going to take, uh, we, that was going to be us. It was going to be coming from, from us still on that show. And then I, I came to, I liked what the audience was picking up on the show. Like I liked that they saw all the details that they, they know what pretty good means in Patriot. They know what cool, yeah, it is cool means in Patriot. Uh, they don't miss anything. The people who love the show, they like it like I like my friends. I, I, I like the little things they do. And we decided that maybe is what the point is. So when we started to make Perpetual Grace, we decided we were going to go deeper into that and not stray from it because it, doesn't feel niche to me. It feels really honest to me. And so there, there's a, I think the slogan for Austin, Texas, keep it, keeping it weird is the town motto. I, I think we learned that that's okay. Like that, it's not weird. 
we're going to keep being personal. Tell me a little bit about your rehearsal process on both TV shows. Do you guys like to rehearse? Do you prefer not to rehearse? Do the actors, do they have different philosophies on that? Yeah, we don't rehearse. The, the actors coordinate rehearsals uh, among themselves mm. and different actors have different needs. I only hire people who are very, very good. But it's just, it's just true of anybody who shows up and parks and then comes to the set. They get what they need on their own and they take ownership over that part of the show. It, it, it's almost like performance has department heads and the actors work it out. When it's time for me to be with them, they show me what they've done. And most of the time I say, man, right on, let's go and shoot it. Sometimes there's little changes, but I think that's just attribut attributable to, to having a sense of the, what a great actor is and not working with anybody who can't be characterized that way. Did you have any collaboration with Mike Dorman in writing John's songs? He seems so naturally comfortable in singing them. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I write the words in the music and then Mike has to perform it and performing a song, you change it. So he's got ownership over those songs because he's the, the voice that shares them. So, uh, no, but I, I, wrote, I, write, I write them. I mean, they, I write the show, so I should write the songs. They're not separated. Like, it's a, it's a one-man job. But um, whenever you, I do the same thing with the Jones sisters. Like, I, I write the first thing, and then I bring the song to the band, and then we, they make arrangements, and we make alterations that amount to co-songwriting. But Mike doesn't do anything like that. But, but he performs them as John, which is part of his job as an actor. And we were lucky that Mike's a really good singer, but he's singing those songs like John. Were there any particular studio notes that impacted your creative process in a completely unexpected way? Yeah, the um, Action Boys, Patriot season two, where we got a studio note that they wanted Cantor Wally, who was essentially our antagonist, this sort of political clerical kingpin to have a security force around him so that it looked kind of tough, I guess, or like other TV shows. So we had to give him a security force, but they didn't say anything except security force. So we cooked up the action boys with their stupid yellow short pants suits and their haircuts <laughs> to, to just say to the studio, well, you didn't say, what they had to look like. So we got, we got the Action Boys out of uh, a studio note that we kind of played ball on. Yeah. But then also figured out. I remember that morning just, there were, there were like guys, the initial idea was like guys in black suits with like, they were coordinating through the earpieces and they had shades on. I thought we can't, Patriot can't do that. It just, they would stop being patriot, you just, it would just go, er, that's it. So, but avoiding that was fun. Yeah, we that's super that. great. Any, any other? Uh, Edward, had to be, Edward had to be kidnapped. Mm. That was a studio note. So we came up with Edward kidnaps himself. <laughs> I love how you dance around that in such a creative way. And do they give you any pushback on that? They're like, oh, that's great. They're, they're, they were really good. I mean, we had good executives. And I get the note. They respected that we came up with our own way of addressing it. And then they said, OK, we're satisfied. So we just happened to have good executives on that show, which you know, it's not, it, you can't take that for granted. You know that I'm a huge fan of the weatherman. <laughs> um, do you mind indulging me for two seconds? And I'm sure there's other weatherman fans here on the on the Zoom. Indulge me. How did you get the idea for the weatherman? Was it a spec? Did someone commission you? Did you just have an idea? I'd love just to get that the genesis of that. Yeah, when I was a kid in in uh, South Florida, we had a weatherman named Al Sunshine. Probably not <laughs> the name he was born with, and. Well, this is another example. Like, I would sit there with my dad and my dad would say, Al Sunshine would come on and my dad just loathed him for being fake. So my dad would say, look at this asshole. He would come on and my dad would go, Al Sunshine. 
what an asshole. So uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Then we, then we were driving down the beach one day and Al Sunshine was on the strip in Fort Lauderdale. Al Sunshine was doing a remote. And one of the kids in my group, we'd just gone to Arby's and wanted to throw his black cow, which is a Arby's milkshake at Al Sunshine. <laughs> And tried and failed, but on the ride home, I, 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 I just started thinking, why would he want to throw a milkshake at Al Sunshine? You probably wouldn't want to throw a milkshake at Dan Rather or Walter Cronkite. Right. But it's, it's, it's the way that that fake interaction bothers people who know better, like people who aren't up for it, people who don't have time for it. The way, it, the way it, it just pisses them off a little bit. Uh, I wondered, how does a guy compromise a life that could have greater, stronger purpose? How does he fall into being Al Sunshine? So I created Dave Spritz, this weatherman, and there was the, <laughs> there was the movie. So, like, so you have this brilliant script. What did you do? Did you have an agent at the time that you were able to give it to him and say, hey, thank you. Stop yes, yeah, I, I did. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Uh, well, Gore, Gore liked it and Gore wanted to shoot it and uh, it was Gore Verbinski and he came on and he was able to get uh, he was able to draw you know the cast together and once the cast came together it wasn't a tremendously expensive film and there was that was an era where when features were still uh, they still had some ambition and then uh, the promotion is one of my favorite under the radar movies any chance of working with John C. Riley again uh, yeah, we're, we, we're talking about it. I think we got something I think we might be doing as soon as we can start shooting again. I consider John one of the real greats. Uh, so, so yes, there's a very good chance. Cameron Fay asks, any chance Chad Schmidt or the revised version Tim Perry will ever get made my favorite script and the best unproduced script of all time in my opinion? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> there's not a chance what it just it we we blew through that moment in time it, it'll never happen it was written for brad pitt when he was a certain age to play a certain age and it was a, a thing that allowed me to write with a little more um confidence later like i knew that those wild ideas could work even though the movie didn't happen i, I felt like it it could take you there. And I thought, well, I can do something different like that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it, Stephen, because actually I don't know what he's talking, I don't know about the script. So uh, Judgment is about a, a young actor in Hollywood somewhere around like 90, 1990. And his name's Chad Schmidt. And he looks a lot like Brad Pitt, except he's like the homely version of Brad Pitt. And he's got a, he's got male pattern baldness and kind of jug ears and a little bit of a weak chin. But he looks <laughs> enough like Brad Pitt that you would make fun of him but he's definitely a poor man's Brad Pitt. And Brad Pitt was gonna play this guy, Chad Schmidt, and shave his hairline and put prosthetics on and- uh, Yeah, that but, sounds amazing. But the trick is he was great. Chad Schmidt was among America's finest young actors. And when Brad, Brad Pitt blew up in Thelma and Louise, he just became kind of a joke and no one could take him seriously anymore. And in order to hope for a, a foothold on his own future, he started to, do like low level criminality in order to pay for his own feature film and oh. <laughs> all, goes, all goes terribly wrong. Well, so, so at that moment in time, Brad Pitt said he would make it, that he would make it with uh, this list. I, I remember getting this email that Brad will make it with Quentin Tarantino, uh, Paul Anderson, Wes Anderson, or the Coen brothers. And you think, well, okay, it's just not going to happen. All those guys write their own movies. Good for, good for Brad Pitt. He knows a good director when he sees one. Right. The, the conclusion I made is, like, you really have to, like, you have to, you don't have to do anything. It's art. There, there aren't rules. You can write one movie, and that can be a fulfilling career. It has helped me to be able to wake up and just go, okay, it's time to write to start with an empty page and see what I can do now. And writing, what? thank God, it's something you can get better at. Like you, you just get it, like you get, you sit down and all of a sudden you're a better writer. It's like playing the guitar, like you suck, you suck, you suck. And then one day you don't, and you don't know what just happened. It clicked. Um, somehow, yeah, like writing is like that. And then for all the scripts that don't 
get made into movies, you know, that one maybe deserved to, but then I've written ones that didn't deserve to, and they were made, and there's no, there's just no getting a hook around it. You, you're along for the ride. Couple of the gang, I want to know, can you talk about anything that you're working on now? Yeah, I have a stop motion animation show at AMC uh, that I'm making with my Chicago partners, Tom Glenn and Jeff Dieter. Uh, I am, uh, have a science fiction show that we're all working on. We're waiting to see what Perpetual Grace might, what a season two might look like. Uh, we haven't figured that out yet. Um, then I am doing something with my brother where my brother is the, I'm writing something for my brother to be the man and the, to be the lead in the show. Is there a genre that you haven't tackled yet that you're dying to tackle? Well, we're making a science fiction show now, and it, science fiction isn't actually its own genre in my estimation, that it allows for a, a Venn diagram overlap of other genres it calls on to try to help you turn pages. Oftentimes it'll have to cooperate with the thriller. Uh, so we're making science fiction, but it, it's really in my estimation, a very Hitchcock thriller kind of kind of thing. Uh, so, so sci-fi, and then I've been dying to make a road, a road picture TV show. So that's its own genre and it's got its own tropes and uh, sort of uh, pole, pole positions that you can use if you, if you get the genre. I like that, I like that one a lot. Um, there's the like systemization of crime, Goodfellas, Narcos sort of genre that we're working on. So those three are, are, are undertakings of ours. Is there a script that is a baby of yours that you still want to get made? A, like maybe a feature out there that you're like, yeah, one day I want to tackle this. Yes, I have a, a there was a, it's a memoir called Ghost Boy. I did an adaptation of it and I'm dedicated to making that film. I think it's a, it, and I want to make that as a feature film. Like I, I think that in order to make a feature film these days, it ought to have like an inherent accomplishment in it. Like it ought to have a reason to be a film. There ought to be a feat involved in it. Otherwise, it, I would make a TV show. And, and but I'll give you an example. There's a film called Lock, which uh, is a Stephen Knight movie with Tom Hardy. And the entire film is, well, the first two minutes he's in a setting and then he gets in his car and he's driving across England. And the, the entire film is him at night in his car going from A to B. And I found it riveting. I just watched Lifeboat last night and was really turned on by how that movie could work with that limited setting. Uh, Ghost Boy is a film about something important that would allow us to, to have to be very good as filmmakers to make a very good movie. So, so Ghost Boy. Because of the pandemic, our industry is obviously shut down and it's going to be changing drastically. What, you know, what's your gut take on where we go from here, do you think that the studios and the streaming services are going to be more risk adverse to really original content? Or um, do you think we'll have more opportunity, better, worse? I think we're going to have more money for shorter days with less demand for s speed on a daily basis. I think we're going to get a little more time. I think we're going to have a uh, somebody on that crew who's responsible for the public health quotient of the day and that the, the cast and crew's well-being is going to be the first order of business on a daily basis. I wish that were true. I don't think we needed a pandemic to make that so. But I think that, that we cannot marshal through a shooting day if everybody isn't demonstrably healthy, demonstrably rested. I think it's going to be ultimately we'll make it through with a greater consideration for that group of 110 people's daily health. So I think there'll be temperatures, there'll be, uh, there'll be, there won't be any more scouting vans. You know, you'll go in small cars. Um, maybe all stadium scenes are gonna be CGI now. Uh, but so, so we'll, we'll be back. And the only thing I think that'll be different is that there'll just be a gentler environment for people to work in. How can I intern at Elephant? I think it's elephantpictures.com and there's okay. an info email. You can go to that and I will, I'll get the, the message. Uh, so that's how. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, go to the website. I know what I would love to end on. What advice do you have for upcoming 
writers and directors, they always just need like that push and that inspiration and how do you break through and break in and any advice you can offer for up and coming talented people? Yeah, and I, I hope it doesn't sound too dreamy, but it's the only thing I really know about sustaining your career over time. You know, you, you'll get in, you just will. I mean, if you, if, you, if you can make a movie, if you can make a TV series that uh, is adequate, you're gonna get in. Look around, I mean, there's room. I think the trick is to really love the art form. You can love one genre. Hitchcock made a genre specific movie almost every time. You can limit what you love. You can only make romantic comedies. You could be Woody Allen who loves movies, who just does that. I'm just gonna list filmmakers who I think are on the top shelf. It's Martin Scorsese, it's Coen Brothers, Quentin Tarantino, it's Paul Anderson. The only common denominator among those filmmakers is that they love film. And they make movies like they love movies. So, so really loving it and not coming to it because it's a good job, I think can make the voice that makes you stronger than the crowd. To be proud to love this art form, it's a really great, it's a great, great one. Have it be true to be said about you that you love film. I think that will give you uh, something that a lot of other people in this business lack.